A team of researchers at Lincoln University is working to determine the flammability of both indigenous and exotic tree species. The aim is to help farmers and other homeowners create low combustion shelter belts and landscapes to reduce the risk of fire and fire spread. It's an increasing concern as dry summers become more frequent. We need to find out about plant flammability for two key reasons. One's a very applied reason, the other one's sort of more an understanding of how the New Zealand ecosystems have been influenced by fire in the past and will be in the present. As far as practicalities go, what we're aiming to do here is test some previous guidelines on the flammability of different New Zealand native species, see how that compares to the expert opinion and therefore we'll start to develop quite a robust ranking of plant flammability across a wide range of species. What we've got here is a series of plant samples from both native and exotic species around New Zealand. And what we're aiming to do is determine the flammability of them. And we'll do that on this um, apparatus here, which we affectionately call our plant barbecue. And what we'll do is we'll ignite a series of specimens and then we'll take a series of measurements on those. Maximum temperature reached, the time of flaming combustion, so how long the fire burns for, and how much of the sample gets burnt. And from that, we can get an estimate of the flammability of each of these species and then rank them according to how flammable they are. Vim one. One of the key things we were testing for this was some previous work done by Liam Fogarty of the Forest Research Institute. And he'd sent a questionnaire survey out to a whole bunch of fire managers and asked them to rank the flammability of different species. The key message from our research is that our findings broadly match what they found. So in other words, the two different survey methods are getting pretty similar results. There were a few sort of interesting ones that we weren't expecting. For instance, both Rimu and Silver Beach were much more flammable in our testing to what they'd been ranked by fire managers. And that was something that, that surprised us and has potential implications if we get severe drought in some of those wetter parts of the country where both Rimu and Silver Beach occur. Uh, so let's do this gorse one, Jen. Gorse was the most flammable species, um, again, probably because of its uh, retention of dead material. We tested a few key species from overseas that we suspected would be quite high in flammability, like eucalyptus, and that was in that sort of second rank of species. We had some New Zealand species amongst those, the rimu and the silver beech that I just mentioned. And then we had a whole suite of native species that we expected to be less flammable, like broadleaf, um, firefinger, uh, uh, tree fuchsia, which we found with our testing were quite low in flammability as well too. Liam's report, it was published back in the early 2000s and it's been used by councils throughout the country, particularly around the Wellington and Porirua region, to provide guidelines for landowners to create what are known as green firebreaks. So green fire breaks are these um, strips of plants of known low flammability that are sort of set up at strategic points throughout the landscape, for instance, up against a, a house or a property boundary. Um, and they're aimed to prevent fire spread or reduce fire spread and stop fires, fire ember attack um, ahead of the fire front. Um, so those council areas and the fire service up there have been working to provide landowners with guidelines on what species to plant up there to plant these green fire breaks. The other thing we can do is we can, it gives us an understanding of which species around the landscape and which ecosystems might be more flammable than others. So we can see where the key fire risks might be, so we can target perhaps the um, introduction of green fire breaks. But we can also provide information to farmers and other landowners that have got shelter belts on their property as you know, to understand which species are more or less flammable, which then gives them another piece of information when they're choosing species for their shelter belts. Across the road here, we've got an example of an accidental fire that's burnt part of a shelter belt. It's burnt the low hedge of the gorse, which has got a whole bunch of dead material. It's older gorse, which we've found with our testing is the most flammable plant of all the 60 species we've tested. But what's happened is the um, strip of trees behind that with low flammable poplar, which we have tested, and willow, which we suspect is likely to be low in flammability. The fire has burnt out. It's burnt all of the gorse, but then it's burnt out against that second um, stage of the shelter belt up against the low flammable species. What we can do is provide guidelines on a suite of low flammable species that farmers can um, plant in their shelter belts if, that, if fire spread is something that they need to worry about. 
Um, so, for instance, in, as far as natives go, they could be planting things like broadleaf, five finger, um, uh, Caprosma robusta or uh, caramu. Um, those are the sort of species we'd recommend of native species. Poplars are one of the exotic species that we tested that has low flammability. So this is just one of the many factors that farmers can think about when they're choosing which species to put in their shelter belts. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.